Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Tino, the last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Komai Kinichiro Lover, and look how happy this guy is now. The Manchurian Executive. Ah, he's very happy. It's just like us, right? But we gotta read about conclusion. It's now over for Li Chung. That was more than clear enough for him to him by now. Bleeding from several wounds on his body and cornered in a gutted apartment complex. Chun heard shouts and footballs approaching. He couldn't tell if it was the police of the Hinbing Doi, but then what did it matter? He was done for anyway. Thoughts of his parents and siblings went through his mind for all of one second before he heard a noise. Bang! Bang! The door that he uh, hastily barricaded was being broken through by the Japanese scum, the hinges and locks creaking with each sound. Bang! Chun couldn't fight back anymore. He checked his pistol. Only one round left. It was all over, wasn't it? All over for him. It was like for all of his compatriots, each of whom who died or disappeared in the hours since the ever-increasing patrols had beleaguered them in the places to hide dwindled to nothing. Bang! The door yielded further, and though it was not yet broken. Oh well, Chun thought. I'm tired now. Too tired. At least I don't have to run anymore. A strange feeling of relief came over, to, over him at that realization. All that was left was a simple one. Open his mouth, put the barrel in, and bang. Well, if we have to. An institutional chokehold. As the chief executive celebrates his triumph against the force of descendants and indolence, Guangdong returns to its old order once more, designed to maximize efficiency and by any means necessary. The factories and manufacturing plants spring back into operation, the monotonous humming of machines heralding the return of the status quo. Workers, whether they were in custody or languishing in the residences, are returned to the original places of employment, engaging once more in the daily tradition of the commute, a surveillance at every corner. The tight policies of police crackdowns and forced inspection are forced once more, and nobody in the state dares to step out of line. Our chief executive's vision for the potential of Guangdong continues on its way to being realized. A society of streamlined production and efficiency, a sort of industry, and a titan of the economy. Now everything in Guangdong is dyed in Hitachi's colors, and we'll get, we'll get to read about charcoal, as we'll read about first. Another cog in the machine. Nothing like it. Gold sings into the air. The time must have been almost noon, yet all Lam Hiao Soon could hear was a bird song through the late dullness of the morning air that hung all around him. This was a relief to him. These conditions enabled him to better hear the sounds of any distant crowds forming. There was a time not so long ago when this was impossible. His job had nearly been unworkable then. Indeed, he knew he had to do some terribly difficult things in the past when things had gone awfully out of hand. However, he felt certain that nothing had corrupted him. After all, he accepted no real money while on the job. His actions were all carried out with conviction and care so that in the end, order was maintained. His actions, no matter what they may be, were carried out with the conviction and care so that order was maintained. There once would have been a little time when Lam would have seen such thoughts as laughable, so disconnected from the world around him and who, who he was that they were absurd. Now, though, there was nothing left to remind him of the early years. Instead, he remains comfortable in the certainty of his position within the future. Even if the furniture itself remains uncertain. He knows each day will come until either sleep or heck takes him. His not to make a reply, but his, his but to do or die. Taste the cutting air. The people are entitled only to the air they breathe. The fittest have survived. Huh. Only Hitachi will have the rule to rule. While the fittest survive and thus thrive as is their right and duty, those that are less than them <clears throat> are by necessity given a choice between dying and spending their lives in the eternal subservience of the betters. So in the state of Guangdong that was built by Komai Kenichiro, those of appropriate merit, demonstrated by their ethnic origin or by monetary abilities, or simply in some cases by choosing the right place to be in the right time, are given direction over workers and the freedom to do what they must be done to increase the profitability of their enterprises. Limp wristed, liberal concepts such as workers' rights or the sediments of the populace have no needs, and other workers groan in pain or suffer injuries, that is good for them since pain builds character. Sal shall remain so long as our chief executive remains in power. He has made sure that no subversive or group of subversives will try to destroy this beautiful paradigm that has been established in Guangdong, stuck in a hamster wheel. Yoshiko walked constantly for as always sure of her destination, always sure of who she was to see. The removal of uh, <clears throat> uncertain that a plagued life was once a uh, welcoming change, but now fell as if she did nothing, but drone on and on about the world's the words about which the men she constantly spoke to said. Nevertheless, she was fortunate. She did not delude herself here. She knew that the lives of those she passed by in the street were much harder, and she is always escapably aware of the fact that if she went out of line, she too would struggle just like them. The world around her operated faster than ever. There was always a new product to ask about, a newer deployment that the legislative council would inquire into, yet there was never any change. Come on, system was here to stay. If touch your soldiers were to be obeyed, and all Yoshiko could hope was to do is to stay alive. <coughs> nice. Charcoal. The secluded industrial sectors of Koshu harbor the lives of many. As well as the toiling men and women yearning for evasive relief of mere survival. With the old, within the old walls of brick and mortar, hundreds of workers dedicated their strength and well towards ceaseless production, yearning for the paltry pieces of paper and metal they would eventually receive. The place has been blended together into a wave of different expressions. Those from imperceptible despair, covered in suit and grime, their hands and fingers rugged and grizzled, worn and tired, told of a thousand experiences without the muttering of a single word. The desire to maintain and provide fuel these people's drive, the want and need for the bare necessities, and their stomachs to be filled, for their bodies remain warm during the cold and desolate winters. 
as ensure that they would remain present and active, engaging the assembly of electronics and appliances that we would never be able to, to afford, to watch as their endless flow of sweat dripped onto the hard steel. The burdensome labor that these men have to undertake, the arduous task that they must complete assiduously, the continuous perpetual motion of the conveyor belts all surmount to one day at the end of each month. A long awaited day for all, a manager and his assistant would descend the rickety metal staircases under the realm of the common folk, the uniforms cleanly pressed and their voices as clear as day. He would end up the pay that the workers seek, he would ensure that they would remain. Like the old charcoal seller of centuries prior, the specter of inequity would always loom over the world. Half a roll of cheap red, cheap red silk, a swatch of damask tied to the ox's horn. Empty smiles, meaningless applause, come on. I was working discontently as he, when a knock came at the door, his door. He saw and called them in, already knowing who had arrived and why they had come. A line of Nissan among your executives filed and filling much of the free space in his office. I presume you have your report to it already, one of the executives. The leader, Kamai, I suppose, spoke to him with an unimpressed voice, as though he had better things to do with his time. Kamai I hated him already. The riots were admittedly difficult, but with your gracious assistance, they've been fully quelled. I thank you all for a part in aiding not only me, but all of Hitachi. Kamai bowed to them, as was custom, but he found he could hardly stop himself from cringing. This wasn't how a man should behave. This wasn't even how a dog should behave, incompetent fools the whole lot, and yet he was at their mercy. He already knew what they would decide about the situation. It was an inevitable decision, and the leader alone spoke again on behalf of them all. We are satisfied that our assistance to you and Hitachi in this troubled time will be a profitable investment. Congratulations on your successful handling of the riots. They turned to leave, but Kamai realized that this was his last chance. Before you leave, Kamai called out, his face immovable as the executives paused in their turn towards the door. Allow me to ask you something. When the leader motioned for him to continue, Kamai sat down in his desk chair. With, will my request for more autonomy in my decisions be taken to the same king? The leader smiled ever so slightly, but there was no warmth in him. He left, and that spoke louder than words. Kamai slumped back in his chair, defeated. The fittest have survived. One of the few things on the, which the chief executive Kamai Kanshiro completely agrees with the German imperialists, a symptom that their deputy of fear, or whatever it is they call him, wants. <clears throat> said. He said that this earth, far from being some kind of fairy tale land, was a struggle for life, a perfectly natural, extremely harsh state of battle in which the fittest could survive. As the argument has been proven true here in Guangdong, the fittest of this great, beautiful nation, that is, the rich have survived and indeed thrived. The upper crust have, swamped and have been swamped in wealth, benefiting him, benefiting from the economic reforms of our esteemed chief executive before the oil crisis. They have also benefited from the consol consolidations during and after the crisis. Amidst all this, Hitachi affiliated businesses have turned Guangdong and the Three Pearls into a hub of trade and commerce at the mouth of the Pearl River Delta. So, any Matsushita and Fujitsu, they were all complacent. Only Hitachi had the will to rule. The continuing heck of iron. Mm, naval stuff, yeah. Guangdong's Navy. The following scene played out through a myriad of families and a myriad of shoddy buildings in all the great and terrible cities that Hitachi ruled Guangdong. A poor mother and father, stuck in a cramped high rise flat, tried to console their crying infant late at night. This was made difficult by the fact that they themselves were functioning on the best of three hours of sleep and often less. The child kept wailing, and his parents understood and sympathized. Had they not been threatened by horrific security apparatus of Guangdong, which had been beaten hundreds of thousands of protesting workers into the ground, they too would start wailing and shouting at the top of their lungs. They were too tired of the backbreaking work. They wanted to be rid of the smog and the affluent. They wanted to be sleeping normally again. They wanted to live somewhere else from here. This horrible crime department sucked the life out of them. As the child kept wailing, and his father held his claws, the mother of the family looked out of the window into the flat of the opulent city in the distance. She longed for a better life away from this poverty-stricken heckle for herself and her family. But after the heck of iron she'd been put through, she wondered if she or her husband had the will left to pursue it anymore. Delerat iste komai. And every day like this. One day was 16 hours of unforgiving work with only a single 10-minute break. <clears throat> Why steeled herself through the, the thirst and exhaustion, and her family squarely at the front of her mind. They starved if I did not keep his job, she thought. That desperation was enough. She barely made quota. On the fifth day, her supervisor struck her with, her palm, with his palm once, then twice. One minute too long on the break, apparently, the sharp crack was audible across the factory floor. But no one lifted their heads or stopped their work. Why well, didn't strike back? Maybe she would have in another time, but that future was closed off long ago. Face still red, she barely made quota. It was the end of the tenth day. The day's distraction was a wailing woman, far too young, whose words were barely audible through her choking sobs. Why well, could barely make out a few over the clanking of the machines? Mercy, another chance, my family. Four black clad men escorted that poor soul roughly off the premises. Why well, barely made quota? No interruption would stop her. Twenty days in now. A silver haired grandfather said it collapsed, so why well, knew he wouldn't last long? He kept complaining rather than working. She didn't know how his name and couldn't afford the distraction to think of what it was, since the stink made it hard enough to concentrate. A few Kempai Tai men came in much later to clean up. Day 30, in her bed in an exhausted wide counted her increasingly meager blessings. She had a job, but a menial one in a Hitachi factory. She could still work, but she needed to, since the family relied on her and hey, she had a predictable future because there was no more hope for any change. Kamai Kenichiro was firmly in charge of every threat to his power snuffed out completely. Welcome to Grim Forever Reality. The docks of Port Shori. For the concrete docks of Bar Shore, Yamauchi could see the endless blue horizon stretch out before him. Yamauchi's eyes, however, were focused on a black dot slowly growing large in the distance. The dot was a ferry that would take Yamauchi back to the home islands. 
You actually arrived in the city almost a decade ago with little to show for it. At every turn, failure was all that had greeted him. The city is nothing but an endless series of setbacks and unexpected turns. Itachi and the Kappa they were to blame for Yamauchi's current fate. It was Itachi's decisions that forced Yamauchi into the underworld. It was the Kappa that came crashing down everything he had built up in the past few years. He had almost been too busy cursing his fate to notice the crowd of the ducks begin to move to board the ferry. As he stepped onto the ferry, took one last glance at Hong Kong skyline, luckily for the last time. Even this last sentimental gesture felt bitter, and Yamauchi turned his back on the city he had once embraced. There's nothing of value left to be had there. The rule of now Guangdong. Dong. As the bright lights of the cities glisten over the shores of the Pearl River Delta, the city of Guangdong turns its attention to the future. Chief Executive Kamaki Kinichiro had forged a seat for himself from the blood, sweat, flesh, and bones of those beneath him, carving out an iron throne for himself, but what was that worth of it all? But what was the worth of it all? The Japanese government is distracted with a myriad of different issues. The Chinese in the North grow bolder and more powerful as their nationalism reasserts itself. Kamaki Kinichiro knows that, that, that thanks to his work, the world knows Guangdong, but he just knows as well that the good name is of no use in defending the Republic against the unswallowing darkness of the future uncertainty. Through Komai, the Komai, like the ancient Greco Roman monarchs of the myriad pre Meiji so shogunates, as possessed of all power in Guangdong, his little despotate uh, is only one cog in the machine that is humanity. Despite everything that has happened, Komai remains a small fish in a big, big pond. Komai can show the master of his house. Will he become a master of the world? Oh, the city status of Guangdong involves the Manchukuo's laboratory, hostile takeovers. The tide was high, in the Pearl Rubber Delta, everything around it flowed, and people filled the streets, of course. Uh, smoke rose high from the factories, and boats fell through constantly, filed through constantly. And from it all, uh, money streamed ceaselessly into the, seamlessly into the pockets of the richest of the rich. The rich, attached men one and all, walked tall through the streets, with their great grins spreading across their faces. They kept their smiles into, into each of the negotiations, shaking the hands of Matsushita contractor here, and then a manager of Fujitsu subsidiary, subsidiary there. One after the other, they always greeted them with the same happy faces. <clears throat> Yet they rarely would get what they wanted so easily. It's never phased them. Their expressions remained unchanged as they reached for the pockets instead. A buy was always a simple matter of who to buy rather than what, of course. No matter how, however, no matter how freely the money poured in on the negotiating table, some still insisted on being stubborn. Their opponents was then dealt with swiftly. Guns were pulled, and in the wide-eyed shock of those at gunpoint, only the same unflinching smiles reflected. The house always wins, and I dedicate this year. As the new year begins, fireworks and other sort of lights crackle across the night skies of a myriad cities of the Delta. Celebratory messages blare from every television and radio set for miles around. The streets are calm and restrained, and the moods of the few people on the streets are solemn. The better for them to continue their work advantageously later, unaffected by the excesses of emotion or sentimentality. This is a Guangdong built by Kamai Kenichiro on the fulfillment of everything for which he stands. The businessmen in Kamai's core are pouring at red. Upward sloped lines with their fingers, and while green bank notes stuff their pockets. Nissan and Mangyo, those mighty, terrible bulwarks of the Manchurian wear or honor guests in the Republic, so it is, so it should be. For all the beauty that Guangdong needs is found in the fulfillment of the Manchurian plan, not in unnecessary beautification measures that cannot be distract workers and officials. The leader of Guangdong danced, bedecked a Manchurian library, and in the world apart from the masses below. Not bad. All right, the air again. Please welcome our honored guest, Kamai Kinichiro. Applause rang out from across the crowd in the ballroom. It seemed genuine enough for us, Kamai noted. Uh, noted though that that was a small comfort. He'd been invited to the celebration, paid for by Meng Yo, and honored this key role in securing Guangdong for the conglomerate. But as the man introducing him joined on, Kamai once again came to the conclusion that for the conglomerate meant for them only, not necessarily for him. Certainly they appreciated what he had done for them, but appreciation only went so far and didn't certainly extend to the independence. The Meng Yo logo being center stage was proof of that. The man introduced him, finished speaking, and handed the microphone to Kamai, which he took, albeit not without a hint of reluctance. If he wanted to decline to speak, though, that would be no more than throwing a tantrum, while Meng Yo's executives watched on from their seats of honor. There's no room for tantrums, no room for disappointment, and the Guangdong he'd created. Thank you all for making time to hear me speak today, Kamai began with a tight smile. I have many great opportunities while working at Hitachi, and I'm proud to have given, have given further opportunities to, uh, to so many others. So as he continued on with his nine mind-numbingly boring prepared speech, Kamai could barely resist the urge to roll his eyes. What nonsense. From now on, he'd always play second fiddle to other lesser men, which was unnecessarily narrowly what he deserved. Alas, there was nothing he could be done at all. I'm greatly honored to be here today, and I'm humbled by your kind applause, Kamai noticed one of the Mongo executives scratching his collar. I was to cut him short. But enough about me, please welcome. Blank, 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 blank. More growth, please. Oh, that's too much debt to GDP ratio. Too much. Literally over three political power day. Poverty, we don't talk about poverty here. The King of Kings. Compared to the challenges of the vanquishing riots, and this, oh, we also look at this too. The road shows would be pitifully easy. After all, he was Kamai Kenichiro, chief executive of the city of Guangdong. All he had to do was simply smile, answer a few questions, and soak in the triumph of victory. 
When there's no need for a long meandering speech, Kumai thought, when my actions have spoken for themselves, and so he spoke outlining in 15 minutes Hitachi's total technological superiority, its iron grip on power, its best in class efficiency. Even then he saw them, the journalists sneaking glances at their watches or staring intently at the wall, doing anything but paying attention to Komai himself. When questions came, only a single hand shot up. Asagawa Toshihiro, I'm from the Nikkei Shimbun. Given your experience in this era, how should Japan encourage innovation? Kumai blinked. That was a rather unexpected question. He improvised an answer. I, well, I think they can learn a few lessons from us. Do you have any other questions? Understood. The Chinese economy has made significant progress in the recent years, far surpassing all expectations. What do you think about China's economic miracle? What do I think? These were frustrated words. Almost bad out. I think you should be asking different questions. Why do you care so much about Japan and China? What about Guangdong's economic miracle? Or our new computers? Look at all we've done. Look at all our works. Immediately after he felt like a fool, full of sound and fury. He was supposed to be the king, the ringmaster, the director, but as he left, he couldn't escape a single question. Was all the world a stage, and he a mere player? To our industrious. To the people who so concern our aesthetics and pleasant smells, and who expect to wake up to the scent of fresh flowers every morning, Guangdong is an unpleasant heckle, but to the searing eye of the chief executive, beauty is far deeper than such superficialities. It is seen in productivity, successful quotas, products sold and exported. By this metric, Guangdong is one of the fairest and most profitable lands of all. The profits are sweet for as long as they st st uh, stack tall. But there's something quite terrifyingly mortal and ephemeral about it all. For all its successes, Komai words that although Guangdong is no richer and more beautiful than ever thanks to the Manchurian plan, this little five is vulnerable in the face of the upcoming war. The fruits of our labor are as limitless as the hunger of our factories. We demand perfection, but we're going to first read about Hack's long, long shadow. If there was a hex somewhere, that certainly its presence on Earth can be found in Guangdong as much as anywhere else. Fireworks crackle in the skies, radios and TVs relay messages across the Delta, but the streets are empty. The city's lifeless, while the people are corpses walking. It's Kumai's Ken Kenichiro's Guangdong, which that is what he envisions, and this is what Hitachi represents. The ruination of the destitute for the sake of the fabulously wealthy, Guangdong is not a home for mankind. There are wretches living in squalor and devils living in high-rises. The former have no money, the latter, latter earn their fortunes by selling their souls. These soulless men have red blood on their hands and the green money in their pockets. They've achieved unprecedented levels of economic growth as they rake in ever more profits, all of it matched only in the immensity by the smog in the air of the public breeze, yes. These men have created a special kind of heck on earth to fuel a haven or heaven just for them, but if there's any justice at all in the world we inhabit, none of them will see any heaven at all when they die. Death is our assurance that no evil shall go unpunished forever into our cooperative. Patriotism, patriotism, patriotism. Glory to cooperation and... Co cooperation and bold defined billboards advertising Hitachi Nissan products are matched only by those that depict and promote loyalty to the government and love for the nation and the omnipresence. Whether there's children holding hands or waving flags in the Guangdong in the Empire of Japan or greeting Chinese, Japanese, and Zhujian workers together at work, there are those that will claim that it looks forced or ripped out of an older playbook. But they are wrong. If Guangdong relies on that old playbook, it's because it has worked once before and it'll do so yet again. Productivity and cooperation has reminded, remained at an all time high, no matter what some may claim about a demoralized populace. The only reasonable conclusion is that Hitachi's method has worked. The energy of her people is boundless as our propagandists' imaginations. Ooh, peace conference is over, huh? Ah, the Wehrmacht mutiny has been crushed. Poison waters, blackened souls. Air poisoned by smog, waters brown and sticky with chemicals. Borders lined with fences not to keep out, but keep in. That's the sort of country that Guangdong had become. As people's backs became strained, the limbs became weary from all the work they performed day in, day out. They received no compensation, no understanding, no sympathy or care. Uh, you had to work or you die. That was life. And those who disagreed might find themselves staring down the barrel of a trigger happy camp by tie gun. Look at this guy. The notion did not stop. A few brave souls who still resisted in what limited ways they could, uh, the oppressive presence of Hitachi. <coughs> but they were always fewer and fewer between the two than they were the day before. Most people didn't simply care anymore. They couldn't. They were too tired. This is what Hitachi realized. People could become tired of resisting even the worst conditions, at least for a time. They used this realization to the fullest. There was no attempt to replicate them with bread and circuses, bread if you worked for it, but circuses were a luxury, and as was entertainment in general. Well, it simply worked until they dropped dead. There was nothing for us to do if they wanted to stay alive, and so they never truly lived. Oh, what do we have here? We demand perfection, not Tanaka. Looks like I'm just in time for the loading. Crew Chief Tanaka, a clipboard in hand, bowed to the approaching Hitachi foreman. You are indeed, sir. He turned to the ship next to him. An enormous tanker's innumerable red containers rose up in the sky. Are easily 20,000 on the deck and ready to go. The each of these boxes fit thousands of products. That means there are millions of Hitachi goods just waiting to be shipped out. Business is booming, isn't it? Yes, it is. I presume we're on track to launch sometime. About that, sir, now. We're very impressed by the amount of products coming out from your factories, but my staff and I are struggling to keep up with the volume. Tanaka paused, nervous, before continuing, trying his best to not look at the foreman. We'd like to ask if the delivery schedule could be slowed down just a bit. Otherwise, we aren't sure if we can avoid accidents. The Hitachi man scoffed. Nonsense. Look at my eyes. Tanaka gulped, then complied. Think for a second. Who loses the most of these electronics sink to the bottom of the South China Sea? The question didn't need an answer. Tanaka stood there silent compl compliant. Good, I want you to understand that we pay top dollar for a reason. If anything happens on your watch, or if there's even the smallest delay, we're more than happy to pay someone else to do your job. Have I made myself clear? 
Countless more hours of overtime, frantic rushes to get things organized and pace, sleepless trudging through endless amounts of work. All this in the hope that one tiny error won't wipe it all out. This is a future for Tanaka and his men, but what could they do? Nothing, and so his answer is obvious. Yes, sir, I understand. To our innovative. The stock exchange numbers swelled to unheard of levels, and myriad neon lights blazing forth from the tall buildings of Guangdong cities, as evident to outside observers as to the average citizen. And the awesome reflections of Kumai's neon fiefdom, the face of the average man on the street show only the reflected glory of Kumai's vision for Guangdong. The results of the tireless slave and unquestioned obedience, say otherwise is unthinkable, and attempt to deny the reality presented for tales of subjective misery. The industries of Guangdong throw together the newest of products, circuitry, and machinery. To a conscious mind, these are a mere petty use of trinkets, but the population keeps on spending. This is all Kumai Kenichiro requires to be satisfied with the state of affairs. The future of our city is as bright as the smiles of her people. Neman Nemain Contradicenta? Kumai Kenichiro, great chief executive of Guangdong, sole arbiter of its destiny and prosperity, stared at the documents on his desk. Outside it was misery and a heck on earth bow enough to possibly make even the Nazis seem twice. The factories turned out more and more, smog was sick in the air, and the waters in rural regions were brown and sticky, sticky to the point where even vermin thought twice about interacting with them. Oof. <coughs> Workers were injured and died every day without hope or help for compensation. But to come on, I can assure those were pleasant statistics on a good spreadsheet. The money came in and no one dared to contra contradict it. The nation's well climbed and brought him happiness. The profits were sweet and would remain sweet so long as it kept stock and tall. But Kamal could not shake the terrifying feelings of morality, or mortality, and ephemerality of it all. To the north, in Kin Ryu and Bukan and Sayan, the drums of war of pan anti pan Asian reaction and general revanchism were sounding ever louder. The shaking was beginning to threaten his kingdom and his livelihood. He had to do something about it. It's now passed on and dusk fell upon the new order in Asia, threatening the Dai Toa Kia Kian in a way that nothing could have ever done before. Kamai made a grim realization. Guangdong had to tow a line or be swallowed alive by a war in which its pissant police detachment and pitiful army detachment, led by a joke of a general, could not hope to defend itself. Kamai had no choice but to prepare, so he said about it in Pace Ot Sapiens Aptarita Indone Bello. I don't read Latin. I apologize. Paper Thumb Patriotism. Far light shone down on the city of Guangzhou, eliminating so much human misery existing in the streets below, as well as the ever flimsy mask used to cover it all. Old propaganda posters stood alongside new, choking the walls of the building just as smog choked the air of the city. Some were banned unless, many more were not. People had been arrested, but much more often people had simply given up on even passive resistance to the 24-7 propaganda campaigns. Some of the posters depicted Chinese and Japanese children holding hands and waving flags, while others portrayed the camp as dutiful protectors of the working people. All far cry from reality, but what could ever an exhausted people do to say so? One particularly prominent work of propaganda was displayed on a billboard by the side of the busy seat, uh, busy seat city street. It portrayed a Chinese police officer supervising a group of laborers working for Hitachi, all staring at the viewer with bright lights or bright smiles on their faces. Though Japanese immigrants and tourists noticed nothing, sometimes Chinese and Zhujian passerbys looking at the police officer's face would get a deeply uneasy feeling. It can only be described as though they were looking into the mirror and seeing a version of themselves they hated to their core. Those who persevered and stared deep into that policeman's eyes sometimes said they saw glimpses of the man behind the poster. It was as if, even if he smiled so wildly, that the model for policemen was saying four little sad words with his eyes alone, I'm sorry for everything. The smiling man weeps silent tears and civilization on the river. Chief Executive Kamai Kenichiro, in his own words, the strong man of the city of Guangdong and the sole guarantee of her beauty and prosperity, gazes out of the glass, great glass windows of his office over the twinkling city on the delta. He's a proud, ruthless man at the height of his accomplishment, but Kamai's prosperity and happiness are threatened by recent events in China. Though it galls him to even think about it, he is forced to admit that the recent occurrences in China, irredentism, nationalism, anti-Japanese sentiment, could change Guangdong's future far more quickly or thoroughly than Kumai ever could. Where she had contact with Japan and slowed, and things are slowly falling from the height reached after the recovery from the oil crisis. As this thought made its rounds through the minds of Kumai and his advisors and sycophants, there is an odd air of pride and grim acceptance. There is also a frightening fact that quickly becomes self-evident to any dispassionate observer. Any action these men take on a whim can result in immediate disastrous effects on the lives of the average Guangdong citizen, all in service for brave vanguard for Pan-Asian industry, and the voracious ambition of touching Kumai Kitachiro. Hole and friends, come on boys and girls, let's go to an adventure with Holy and friends. How clapped as a cheerful, high-pitched melody started playing. He looked at his mother with an infectious smile as he wolfed down his instant ramen cup. His mother looked at him and entirely smiled black. Back. Come on, everyone, let's sit down, sit down the pearl rubber and look for, for treasure. But, Huli, what about all the scary pirates? What about the giant sea monsters? Don't worry, Gui, the samurai will protect us. How's mother rolled her eyes, who were Huli and her friends were merely Japanese propaganda disguised in the wonders of childhood entertainment. Who are the samurai, Huli? Great question, Gui. Samurai are ancient people who have looked over and protected us forever. They feed us clothes and defend us from evil. Wow, the samurai sound amazing. I wish I could be a samurai. How's mother quickly clicked the radio off? Mother, why'd you turn it off? Asked Hal, upset that his favorite show was interrupted. It's sound sleep, the mother said. But, mother, please, it's been a frickin' long day. And we are the market, too. Chance meeting the man, the man was distant. His gaze 
blank and unfocused. So it was a woman who spoke first. Hello, Officer Hayashi, she said. Hello, Mr. Yasukawa, he replied. That's what was at, what met was before the riots. Yeah, it was a very difficult time. A long pause. I stood a few feet apart. And it felt a lot larger. So I see. Well, we now have peace. So are things better for you? An uncomfortable emptiness opened between them again, broken briefly by the sun and boots around the corner. The officer looked away from the woman, his low, voice low and almost inaudible. Yes. Two faces looked at each other and the world and found something wholly unrecognizable. There was nothing left to talk about. None of their empty words could heal the wounds they now carried, could repair what was torn apart. Somehow, well speaking, they both understood that. A stifled cough. I apologize, but I need to leave. We must meet again, officer. Yes, Miss Yasukawa. We must meet again. And that was the last they ever saw of each other. Unfortunate for them. Ah. In the catalog of electronic and mechanical products offered in Guangdong, Hitachi, now dominated the field. Televisions, air conditioners, home baths, copiers, fax machines, even the state-of-the-art equipment, and expensive Hitachi 8700 series mainframe computer was listed. With such catalogs so crowded by products from Hitachi, it was their machines that catched everyone's attention first, and the machines that everyone buys first. It was ingenious. Hitachi turned the market itself into advertising for the products. Even as, even as such an abundance of Hitachi products being listed for sale drew more and more attention to Hitachi, however, also draws attention away from those who were once able to be called their competitors. No longer are they worthy of the title reduced as they are to fighting each other for the limited space that exists to sell the products in a market wholly owned by Hitachi. Each and every other company, if it has a presence in Guangdong at all anymore, has been reduced to nothing more than Komai's plaything. The house always wins, my friends. Always wins. Let's see, they have like a four guys here that might support us, maybe. And no one there. Let, never let me go. Hey, picked up one of those ex exercise books on his desk, feeling the rough brown paper cover on his fingertips. When he held it in his hands, it felt foreign and real like a relic of some long bygone era. How long had it been since he was asked at school? Whether out of curiosity and nostalgia, he looked at a page open, expecting to come across the remnants of his time at school. At first, it was difficult to make out exactly what they were, rather because the pencil marks had faded with age and the paper was a cheap mass produced kind. He held it close to the light, squinting to see what it was on it. Inside was a trove of dis detailed diagrams, meticulous drawings, studies of machines, and electronics to elaborate. Why? So elaborate, why I wondered whether they were actually his? He took his front page again. Yes, it was really him, Lee Hay, scrawled on blocky letters of a child. Again, resist urge his mom. With a simple pencil, he managed to create sketches that were the equal of anything he saw in the books he was once allowed. There were even some new designs, too, iterations on existing products in the market. The memories began floating back, his mother and father praising his talent, running after why to get back to his pages. Uh, disgusting dreams with China at midnight, but instantly bitterness set in. All of that was past. How skilled he was, how hard he worked for, how creative his designs were. That didn't matter a jot. As far as Hitachi was concerned, he was useful only as a laborer or consumer. Before I was out of control, he stopped it all, picked up the books, his books, and went outside. It was dark outside, and the fire lit. And the fire lit, he lit was the only source of light there. He took out the books, burned them quickly, and snuffed out the ashes, going back to where it was supposed to be. It's better not to hope, after all. And his dream is dead. Hey, not bad for at least a plus. Civilization on the river, my friends. Oh, and no longer products like them. Rex Fidelismus. A view from the chief executive's office, a sweeping vista of factory and smokestacks and tenement work warned along the Pearl River. Lit by the unnatural orange glow of a smog streaked sunset, almost made Komai Kenichiro forget his distaste for his captured fiefdom. He shimmered the sneer on Ibuka's face when he had first met the man, invited by the infinite wisdom of Ibuka's maniac or manic vision. A low pond to be used in service of Guangdong's erstwhile king. He regarded his revulsion as seeing Matsushita clung to the coattails of his powerful of the powerful, hoping that the drugs of authority would stick to him, like fetid water splashing or splashed by a passing car. And Marita Komai smirked as he recalled Marita's sanctimonious preaching about responsibility and accountability. While his allies did all the dirty work, allowing him to delude himself as a saint when he was anything but a dreamer, a parasite, and a fool. How Guangdong had survived so long was beyond him, even if that had been to Hitachi's ultimate benefit with a Komai flipping the script on Guangdong's would-be princes. The phone rang, ripping Komai's attention away from his fiefdom and back to the dark interior of his office. A small fate as he raised the receiver to his ear, the shrill ring replaced by an electronic silence waiting to be fulfilled, uh, with new orders and new instructions, of course. Even if the sight of Guangdong could satisfy him in the moment, he was too... He too was kept at the beck and call of an unseen matter or master, a company of man directed by a script not of his own design. This is the king calling, and thus ends the story of the Manchurian executive for now. Uh, thank you so much for playing Guangdong. We hope you enjoyed playing it as much as we did making it. And this is the end of the path for being a Manchurian puppet for Kumai Kinichiro. Kumai Kinichiro may have borrowed the gun he used to seize control of Guangdong, and now the loan has come due. Even as a petty tycoon to the legislative council squabbled amongst themselves, Kumai Kenichiro has always served a larger power, and has always answered to their wishes. Among Yo and Nissan were never above uh, underhanded tricks to eliminate the competition, making Kumai their agent on the inside, they consume and subvert Guangdong's energy for Manchuria's benefit. With Kumai safely in power, such an investment was obviously worth protecting him, him from the chaos of the riots, a convenient excuse to leash him ever closer to the powers that be in the king. 
Whether through money, obligation, or outright intimidation, Kamai will never be never forget who his two masters are. It is 72. And Guangdong enters a terrifying future under its new masters, one Koshu and the other Tsin Siking, which is up awesome. Awesome, awesome. Which I really kinda wanna see what a Ooh, look at this guy. Um tree would be like for Manchuria to see how much influence uh, they would have over us as we try to get through everything. Ooh, actually we need more grid power too. Oh, that's not good. But that ends, like I said, the path for Kamai Kenichiro's Manchurian path, which means now we gotta go back and do the personalist path and see what he's really like as a person when he doesn't ask for Manchuria for any sort of aid. But if you enjoyed this path, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow as we'll continue to see what's up, up, up with uh, Kamai Kenichiro. Thanks for watching, and have a great Manchurian rest of your day.